This is The New Right, a podcast for the lost arts, reclaiming the literary holy land from the heathen. This is Matt Pegas. And this is Dan Baltic. And uh, we're joined today uh, by a guest who uh, needs no introduction, as they say, Jack Mason from the Perfume Nationalist. How's it going, Jack? Thanks for having me. Uh, Yeah, it's going well. Drinking a French press, getting caffeinated late at night. (laughs) feels good yeah i know for sure i um just coming back from work which is now in the office again which is a big crazy change in life but anyway i uh had like a double double matcha because it was the only caffeine we had there so i am done with my beverage now but i'm also caffeined up (laughs) (laughs) good i am only having la croix but uh i assure you that i'm uh i'm all perky so I refuse to pronounce it LaCroix, even though that's technically <laughs> correct. I'm never going to say LaCroix. LaCroix, all the yeah. way. LaCroix, all the way. Ab fab. <laughs> I'm actually also having a LaCroix, or LaCroix, however the Oh, there we yeah, go. Yeah, so, uh, anyway. Um, no, uh, we really appreciate you coming on, Jack. Obviously, you are a uh, A-list, top-notch uh podcaster um and we are but a small humble podcast so we, we definitely appreciate uh your your endorsement and uh well thanks i think this us. is the first time i've ever been described as a list so uh i'll take <laughs> it well yeah i know it's is there is there an a list of podcasts i think sort of you know in our sphere obviously we're all uh, a little bit a little bit more on the fringe so to speak but i think uh you know you're right up there with, with red scare and come town i guess would be would be the a list if, if, if i mean up. they're like really really rich i <laughs> make enough to make a living so hopefully i get that kind of money um yeah we, it would help we, it would help if i were a hot girl you know well but, yeah uh, yeah <laughs> i think i'm currently somewhere in the b list the low b's in terms of uh income but you know we'll see i mean uh yeah your your podcast is obviously grown substantially i think probably even since we last spoke jack which was um i it was 2020 i um was i co-hosted the episode you did with robert stark uh on his podcast uh, back in like april of 2020 um and you know robert is still a friend of this podcast uh and you know i i i still co-host on that podcast sometimes but have basically started uh, new right with Dan uh, to focus more exclusively on literature, but um, yeah, I think that was one of the first podcasts I ever guessed it on. Yeah, I feel really like early yeah. On. yeah, yeah, and it was um, if I do say so myself, and obviously Jack, you've done perhaps other ones as well, and I don't want to speak for you, but I think you might have even said something to the effect at the time that it was, it felt at the time like a pretty good encapsulation of kind of what you were all about and and what what your podcast was all about um as i recall sure yeah definitely definitely kind of touched on a lot of i don't know i don't even know what you'd call it just some of the some of the more general like aesthetic themes that were kind of what in the water and i i'm really glad that robert and i talked to you at that point because i feel like it was right at the cusp of uh of the perfume nationals becoming a lot bigger um Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it got a lot bigger as did uh, many podcasts with the the COVID podcast boom. So yeah, uh, okay, was, absolutely. Is that what I was you fortunate call to it? have existed well, for a year before that? Yeah, but um, yeah, everybody, most of the podcasts circulating around now started right around then. Um, we had the benefit of having started 
quite a bit before that so yeah um no 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 i uh i think it's probably good to have that you 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 might you might have been in uh definitely the right place at the right time with it then because i think i mean i've listened to no i can't say i've listened to all of like the first season of the perfume nationalist but i listened to a lot of it and i think you were in a good position where you were able to like sort of get your main message out there and like kind of perfect the art on a like a technical level and like get used to the sort of flow of it and then you were ready to just kind of blow up uh around around that uh yeah yeah beginning of covid i guess podcast boom Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean uh yeah when we started um people on like right-wing twitter still flipped out about like voice doxing and like gay stuff like this there was not like you know, like, Cantbot hadn't done Tech Wars yet, right. BAP hadn't started his podcast yet. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was a much more cloistered environment when we started. It, it was, and I, I remember it. I put that in the outline for today um, because I think that uh, the vibe has, has shifted significantly, uh, to, to borrow a phrase I've seen. The vibe shift. Kick it around <laughs> Twitter. Um, and, you know, because I'm not exactly like an OG OG when it comes to, like, I don't know the dissident right or whatever you want to call it, but at this point I've been around a little while, and I def I, I got online and, and started I started doing uh, again Robert Stark's podcast where where we last spoke, and I started doing that in like 2018, uh, which doesn't feel like that long ago, but it's I guess a million years, yeah, ago. kind of a million years ago. And as you said, uh, I, I don't I don't like to to box you know our sphere into any one term. I don't think dissident right really does it justice and frog twitter is kind of its own smaller thing so i don't know what to call it but but generally speaking you know uh, um the, the the broader umbrella in which we're operating has uh has changed a lot and i think changed for changed for the better um Absolutely. and i think it's i so much better yeah <laughs> so so much looser uh so much more fun uh people are like people are much more uh, free to do what they want and everybody tends to have a better sense of humor and like the humorless people have gone off into their little ghettos where they yeah uh, <laughs> no e exactly safe from everyone normal right uh like like in a frequent tpn reference point safe <laughs> oh yeah For they're sure. all in the carol white igloo yeah, yeah. no it's mm -hmm. uh it's pretty pretty good uh yeah pretty good way of describing it but um no, I, I don't want to appear too, uh, too 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 much like a sycophant, but I do think you. That's okay. I like it. <laughs> I do think you personally and your podcast had had a lot a lot to do with with said uh, vibe shift for sure. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. No, I think uh, just just in terms of it's kind of being this good 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 mix of both arising out of frog twitter while also kind of breaking the mold a little bit and again just at, at the right at the right moment um mm -hmm. yeah because again I, I i i guess was there to see this shift happen i mean I, I'm, I'm remembering back like 2018 even into 2019 uh i, I was kind of just like messing around on like the i guess what would we call like the the shallow end of, of like the alt right on twitter which was it kind of provided some some interesting background that I still have to like um, you know be on that corner of Twitter, but like it, it was basically as you said, it wasn't really a fun place. It's people freaking out about um, you know I, I don't want to use the term purity spiraling, but you know what I mean. Where it's oh yeah, yeah. and that has been uh, transposed into other things like the holistic uh, seed oil crowd, <laughs> which. Um, <laughs> You know, I'll take seed oils over the relentless emphasis on, you know, like JQ and all this at the beginning. Because, right. like, like, when I came onto Twitter, you couldn't talk about movies. They would flip out at you if you'd talk about movies because that was Jewish degeneracy. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I remember that really well, um, that, that, kind of, that kind of vibe. Uh, it was a big deal. One of the first kind of, like, meme things that I did when I had a really small account, I started just posting, pic like, cool pictures of Madonna. Mm -hmm. And that was, like so outlandish with the hashtag madonna posting and like my like group of friends did it too and that was considered just like just so wild to just post a cool picture of madonna yeah without you know some insufferable 
a caption about you know some kind of purity, uh, yeah. trad purity that can Re- be attained. reject modernity or whatever, or like um, condemning Madonna in some way, you know. Well, well, it's interesting because I guess this subculture within a subculture that I think has now become a much more dominant trad, thanks to your podcast and, and other forces. Uh, it was always there. Like there always were some people who wanted to talk about movies. There was people who wrote fiction, published fiction. It was there, but they they were always. It was always a battle to be fought. Like it always, we always had to like justify our existence. Like why 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 deal with like degenerate popular culture or whatever the case might be. It was always kind of like this exception mindset, where it's like you really would have to like say, I know this is trash, but you know it was. That's yeah, kind of how you all had to those get past guys the are the ones who ended up pushing Joe Biden in the last election. Oh yeah, yeah, we're talking about yeah. Like all the... those guys pushed Andrew Yang and then later Joe Biden. <laughs> um, so that's where they ended up. Yeah, I uh, I don't I wouldn't and expect now pushing Ukraine. Right? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah it's... <laughs> all goes together. Um, Jack, I know you you probably see all kinds of stuff online, so I'm not I wouldn't uh, expect you to even remember this, but I I um one, when we first met and became mutual followers around the time we did that podcast with with robert stark um i had a blog that uh i only bring it up not so much to talk about myself but because i think this kind of encapsulates the vibe of the twitter sphere at that time and also like what i was trying to do to be some small part of it um which uh, do you remember uh i think it probably would have been a link that robert sent it was called alt of center.com no, it wasn't about Bijan. It was about there like was one about Bijan that was from one of y'all that I remember. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that one. Mine was like uh, it was about uh, it had a lot about like Death in June and Camille Paglia and like stuff that you were yeah. talking about independently. Although I hadn't crossed your, your yes, path with I you. I totally remember that. Yeah, yeah, and it was kind of had a kind of floral aesthetic. Um, just as a disclaimer, <laughs> I don't know if any of my current our current listeners would even. Uh, think the one thing or the other about this but at the time i was writing a lot about what uh it was kind of like a meme ideology called uh homo nationalism which i guess is not even a meme ideology i guess it's kind of real but uh i had a couple mm-hmm. articles about that and about camille Paglia's take on that um my my disclaimer is that i'm not actually gay so i probably shouldn't have necessarily tried to have been the uh, uh voice what piece a for shame that. Matt stealing valor. <laughs> I, it was a, a, You're a little, appropriating a, a little our bit culture of cultural, is not your costume. A little bit of cultural appropriation, a little bit of stolen valor. But for whatever reason, I think just because I was interested in a lot of the more artistic stuff, um, I felt pretty pretty passionate at a certain point about about that topic and about uh, the the whole sort of idea of like a, a gay fascist underground and and what that could represent. Um, was was an idea of, uh, of intrigue to me at the time, and I, and I definitely, obviously, as I don't even I don't need to tell you, Camille Paglia has all kinds of interesting things to say on that. Uh, but again, I don't bring this up to to to, to reference older work uh, so much as just that was that was kind of what I was um, dealing in at the time. It was like you know alt of center, so try you know some kind of play on alt right, right? And it was like right. you you do that and you. Uh, you try to make these, you know, you you almost argue too hard for these points about like why, why, uh, you know, why why certain cultural artifacts or certain kinds of people or, or artistic people or in this case gays, you know, what why there might be so, so some interesting sort of contributions there that to bring to the to the table if we're talking about you know nationalism mm-hmm. or whatever the case might be and well yeah um, because when men are allowed to commune. Uh, without the the presence of women, uh, things naturally run more efficiently. So um, right. uh, that's, that's why gay men are um, not even in the uh, victimhood pyramid anymore. You know, like mm-hmm. re- unless you totally uh, abase yourself at the foot of the you know current uh, trans mulatto favored disabled kind of uh, minority that they're pushing unless you do that or become one of these creepy like anderson cooper uh rachel maddow like msnbc mm-hmm. spiritual lesbians um you're considered a privileged uh entitled enemy and they sense that early on i mean i, t- I talk about it a lot but you sense the negativity about uh gay men 
almost immediately after gay marriage was passed. So you had the Jezebel yeah. articles come out saying uh, gay men need to examine their misogyny and their privilege and all of this. And that was like 2013, 2014. Yeah, no, I, I remember it. And I, I, I think that's another reason I wanted to write about it. I just thought it was, I thought it was, I just thought it was interesting. I, and I thought that it was a, a kind of a fertile ground for cultural pushback. And, you know, it's a blog that I wrote that didn't, I didn't get many readers. I think it's still up. I'll, I guess I'll like link to it when I post this episode, because it's not something that I promote anymore. Um, but kind of in thinking of that, I feel like what you did, Jack, with your podcast, and with your general web presence was like kind of, uh, you know, it, it, an embodiment uh, of some ideas I was just kind of poking at, you know, and uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so glad I know at this point, we're talking about it's kind of crazy that even 2020 was two years ago. So so now this too is, is history. But I, I'm so glad that um, I guess basically, uh, the, the, the general the general, you know, dissident right, shall we say, uh, sphere uh, did move, did move in the direction that I guess I'd initially hoped it might, uh, it, you know, yeah. embodied by I mean, the, like the number one influence on culture right now, and especially on this space and broadening, uh, this, this space that we're in, whatever you call it, it was Red Scare. Um, and yeah. every single thing that people are saying and doing descends from Red Scare. And most of them probably don't even know, that that's where it came from but yeah red scare uh came about um early 2018 right uh let's see and then tpn started february 2019 um but yeah they 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 were certainly the dominant force way more than any of these like 2016 all right guys who you know big account anon guys who would probably like to take all the credit uh, Red Scare has been more positively influential uh, on the culture at large than any of them. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I saw this this meme going around yesterday. Did you see this? Uh, welcome to the right wing. We got the gay guy, the gay guy, the gay guy, the gay guys. It's like pictures of like, Hashima, that. Yeah. like Peter Thiel, uh, the, the guy yeah. that came up with the French guy that came up with like white replacement theory. Yeah, that it just reminded me of that. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I mean, I don't want to get too into the weeds of like politics and stuff but basically the, the alt-right of, of that time was it was a total dead end um but i feel like the the the, the better ideas the the better the better stuff from the you know the trumpian moment and the and the right wing sort of cultural pushback of that time uh has gotten sort of transmuted into something uh much those guys better. all did it to themselves yeah they have no they have yeah. no one to blame but themselves because they dumped trump really early on for ridiculous reasons and they horseshoe theoried back to libtardism because they yeah. refused to be normal and <laughs> uh it, a lot of my big theory about that is which is not popular with them of course is that um their impulse for internet anonymity causes them to like schism into multiple personalities as in uh, alfred hitchcock's psycho where like all the worst aspects of their personality that are displayed online under this like anonymous avatar are on one side and then in real life they're this meek little you know like a nerd guy eating tendies and ketchup and yeah. uh because they did not unite the two halves they went crazy and they uh ashamedly became libtards once again and they don't even know that they're <laughs> libtards they're just nowhere yeah, no, I, I think there really is something to that. I mean, when I early on when I was getting online and and whatnot and I hear every opinion sort of under the sun and, and like everything in between as to, you know, do you be anonymous or not? And as right now, I you know, I, I, I'm basically public with with some precautions taken. But um, yeah, like one of the I think some of the most compelling advice that I heard was that like the the pitfall of being anonymous and i should say i do think you know there are some people who who probably have, have very good reasons for that and who, who small minority to do it. there's a small minority of good normal people who do it just because they don't want their online lives in interacting with uh anything they do in real life but if you're going to fashion yourself as a cultural critic or a public figure and you want to change the culture genuinely you're not going to get it anywhere totally anonymous yeah uh, this is just a simple fact and a big reason that 
uh, Red Scare had so much influence is that they are not anonymous. Obviously, yeah. it's easy for them because they're girls, and girls don't experience the same consequences as guys uh, in almost any area. Um, that's also how they like have managed to get it past this whole time. Um, but you simply like you top out very quickly in terms of what you can do anonymously because people simply don't connect to it you seem untrustworthy and you seem cowardly no matter the the galaxy brain reasons that you come up with for why everyone must be anonymous as you know opsec self-protection measures you look like a coward if you're a man who is unwilling to put your face to your words hmm. and it's harder for people to relate to you like, yeah, people if you don't can't relate. See your face, they're then... just not naturally interested. Like yeah. they, you you can be as great a writer as you want to be on Twitter. You can tweet as well as you want, but you're still going to top out in terms of uh, how much people connect with you if you're yeah. an anonymous avatar that people know nothing about. Yeah, no, I think your earlier point is also very true that a lot of people just end up. I mean, literally, I. I don't really speak from experience here, but, you know, I've had anonymous accounts or whatever. Like, you, you end up saying stuff and kind of getting into the logic of stuff that you don't necessarily believe, but you can... I, I do think, as you said, I think there's people out there who, like, actually have a set of ideas that they engage with online and then have a live by just a completely different set of ideas. And I think that is a little bit schizo... And you're just not a fulfilling way to be on a personal level. And then, yeah, also, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like just, yeah. just patently dark and mentally unhealthy to um, create this system for yourself where everything that you see as true in society and in your life, you must use an anonymous puppet avatar to say. So mm-hmm. you start to de- develop a really unhealthy, dark view of the world, which is, of course, compounded by the uh, unprecedented insanity of the moment that we live in. And obviously the the cultural construction of libtardism uh, that we operate under. But you start to say and do things that are just inhuman because you don't have to connect your identity with them and i always hated that i've always been i've never particularly liked you know quote unquote trolling Mm -hmm. or like been one of these guys who's like too cool for school and like irony poisoned and all of this like part of this is that i'm a millennial and i'm 34 and i was the first generation that they dumped social media on so millennials are largely unable to separate their uh social media identities into different little uh, compartmentalized categories so you see like zoomers uh young people will have their irony poisoned like billy eilish like glazed over eyes uh type cool meme main accounts and then they'll have like uh their private accounts that are locked where they just like threaten to kill themselves and like get <laughs> funny. Mm-hmm. and this is not any more attractive to me than simply putting it all in one place. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's just uh, it's just a question of energy and like how I, I don't know I, I don't understand how how some people can can even be that divided. Like I again, this is speaking as someone who's kind of tried different things online, you know, going like almost aggressively public and then reeling a little bit back and, and then going totally private and having you know, locked accounts and all that. Like, I have tried a lot of these things, and, and overall, like, yeah, you just need to put it all... I, I think it's strongest and most powerful if you can put it all in one place. Yep. Yeah. And look at all of the people ha- who have been most instrumental in and most brave in effectively changing the culture in any positive mm-hmm. way. Uh, you know, my friend Amanda Milius is one. Right. Everybody loves her. Uh, you know, no one could dislike her. Not the worst libtard on earth could dislike her. Uh, Dasha, Anna, you know, uh, Tucker, whoever yeah. you want to talk about. You know, they they all have a face and a name and an identity. And um, 
none of these guys, none of these anonymous guys have had anywhere close to that impact. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, to, just to, to, to hit one last point on, I guess, the history of all this. Uh, it, it is, I, I, it's interesting to hear you talk about um, the podcast explosion of like early 2020. Cause I, I guess I've never been totally clear, like, did I just start following a bunch of accounts at that time or did everyone, you know what I mean? Like you kind of lose track of that online sometimes. Like what, what, when is there a vibe shift and when do you just start getting interested in different things? But yeah, there was, there was very much a vibe shift. There was a vibe shift then for, it was very noticeable, especially, uh, uh, the first part of COVID, um, that like pre George Floyd, COVID, yeah, pre George yeah. Floyd, like, which actually there, was a pretty good time, as I recall. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there was a month where wokeness was over, and that yeah. was the, the there was this big like cross pollination. That's when you know Red Scare, Can't Bot, me, all of these people are kind of like cross pollinating very freely, and because of the imminent threat of COVID, which then appeared to most people to be um, a uh, like an apocalyptic plague on the level of like Stephen King's The Stand, where there were going to be like bodies in the streets. There was this excitement, I, and nobody cared about the last ten years of libtard right. woke. Absolutely, woke. It, it cultivated it, a certain yeah. openness. But go on, sorry. But yeah, yeah, and then that was before the libs figured out how to narrativize it, and yeah. uh, when George Floyd occurred. Uh, that's when it all came into place and the real moment they sealed the deal and ensured their uh, cultural hegemony was when they declared that the real virus was white supremacy. Yeah, in, yeah. like halfway through the year. No, no, what Absolutely. a crazy, crazy thing to live through. Um, but that is that's pretty much exactly how I remember it as well. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, in terms of that positive earlier phase, yeah, what do you think it was that, that led to that cross pollination? And I just want to hit this as another like cultural point. I, I, uh, the movie it's, you know, it's almost like a dead meme now, but, uh, TFW, no GF was also very much of that moment. Would you right, agree? Yeah. yeah. My, my friend Alex Moyer was instrumental in that because that movie, um, which as everyone knows had the can bot and others in it uh it was supposed to show at south by southwest and then south by southwest was canceled right and so it premiered online on amazon and there was just a week where it, well there was a week where everybody was talking about it in anticipation and then there was a week where it was actually streaming and then everybody was talking about it again so it um <laughs> like it feels corny to use the word in this context but representation there was this there was this clear moment of some kind of shift in what can be how this subject of you know quote unquote incels alt right uh you know all of this stuff uh maga how this can be dealt with in mainstream media and you know the the critics predictably kind of like rained down libtard horror on that movie when it came out. Um, but the fact that it came out uh, was a huge thing. And then COVID kind of reversed all he, most of the progress made during that month because there was yeah. just no way out because of this uh constant authoritarianism compounded by the occurrence of the election and you know january oh, 6th and all no that. it got it went from it was just like this slow fizzle towards being like totally totally fucking shitty but yeah it start. i i remember when tfw no gf came out that, that same feeling that that certain cultural barriers are somehow coming down i don't know why it necessarily was uh or just because yeah, it, it had to do with uh, with Bernie getting defeated, I guess, by Biden, probably a little bit, and, and just the general openness right. of that time. Uh, cultivated, the Bernie yeah. people who have <laughs> the Bernie people who have played such a um, interesting and annoying role in all of this, basically for you know four or five years, Bernie Sanders existed as a way of. Uh, critiquing liberalism and the Democrat Party while still being one of the good guys. So you could get away with, like, you know, in the early days of Red Scare, this is how they got by. 
uh, by identifying as a, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders kind of socialist as part of that movement, you could criticize the Democrat Party um, and make fun of things like Hillary Clinton now, which is nothing now because you see like mainstream movies making fun right. of Hillary Clinton and stuff like this. This is all the all that kind of dirtbag left Bernie stuff that people still think is really novel is really dated and it's quickly being adapted by uh, mainstream media and, you know, filtered in some way into uh movies uh, yeah. which are lightly being infiltrated with a sort of anti-woke sentiment because mm-hmm. they so there's simply nothing else to do yeah. um and there the people are probably realizing uh that that is profitable as we see with these this little crop of uh kind of envious uh like buzzfeed and daily beast like uh hit pieces about this scene mm-hmm. um yeah and uh but yeah, the Bernie people uh, had nowhere to go after that, and all of their okay, that whole scenes podcast they were all about Bernie. Okay, Chapo yeah. was all about Bernie, <laughs> True and on all of that. All these people they did nothing but talk about Bernie, um, and so they had nothing to do. And so what ended up happening was uh, they all made their podcast into basically the Perfume Nationals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so suddenly in a month everybody's just like talking about movies and like culture and like oh no yeah that's true that's yeah. uh yeah uh, it's an... uh, now that i think about it uh, yeah. like chapo like would have like you know various like authors and like uh-huh, movie makers yeah. on and it'd be like oh it's the the chapo movie Where, whereas before it was like all podcasts had to be nothing but policy wonk <laughs> You know, unironic Bernie Sanders promotion. <laughs> yeah, no. like, oh, that's over. <laughs> yep. it's the next uh, episode. And you see what those people do. Like I call them crypto libtards. Um, I won't even cut off the tard out of politeness anymore. Uh, but they're crypto libs, and you can sense their spiritual libtardation. And they've kind of like slummed with uh, you know the people like us down here. But every time they get an opportunity to uh feel the warm embrace of uh democrat orthodox normalcy once again through some uh psyop or massive cultural event like kyle rittenhouse uh you see those people uh schism and then like jump back on the democrat yeah. bandwagon um and it's very easy to identify those people uh once you have existed in this scene for a little while like what may appear base to you is actually a crypto libtard red flag like <laughs> tim dillon for one is crypto libtard yeah. if you see the certain if you're talking about um satanic pedophile elites if you're talking about epstein uh if your your point is like democrats are the real racist if you say both sides are you know the same thing if you promote not voting those are all crypto lib uh, red flags, and you're actually just a libtard. I see. And, uh, so it's like clothing. it's like the new new conservative sort of, but also like a bigger, bigger, bigger mm-hmm. umbrella. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I no. think yeah. these are a couple of really good filters. Rittenhouse was one. Everyone who uh, is on the wrong side of was on the wrong side of that was, you know, basically a, a crypto lib. And the same is uh, for Russia and Ukraine, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I've, I've been so tuned out of Russia, Ukraine, just because of the total exhilaration and relief that they've retired the COVID plot line for now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's yeah. just, you know, like me walking, like, uh, you know, perfume, com- depression medication commercial walking out into the sunshine uh, just because they fucking done away with COVID finally. Uh, knock on wood. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it, it Thank is you, the Vlad. same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's as God Rittenhouse was the really big one. Rittenhouse yeah. was the one where all of those people who had spent the last year going like libs are this libs are that I'm a fearless anti woke cultural critic. They did not have the balls to choose the patently morally correct side in that because their adherence to libtard racial dogma is simply too strong they still think of democrats as the good guys um they still think that you cannot be a good person without identifying as a democrat liberal Mm -hmm. and they feared that it was low status because Mm -hmm. they saw the other people who were supporting rittenhouse and they're like well there's not enough of like the right people on this side the cool people the the whatever and and they got so mad yeah yeah 
But for as much uh, crypto libertardation as is going around, uh, a lot of the kind of better people from what was then, I mean, you probably, at this point, you wouldn't even say Anna and Dasha even count as a uh, dirtbag left, right? I mean, you wouldn't. Oh, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, don't ma- they don't mask it at all. I mean, they, uh, yeah, they, um, there was a, definitely a total shift, especially once Anna had the baby. It seems like the uh, desire to, uh, sort of slightly mask it t- completely went away. No, they don't give a fuck yeah. at all. They were always right. the most influential, and they were always on the right side. And yeah, pretty yeah. much them and and Amy Therese and maybe there's other names I'm forgetting. But yeah. uh, but, but but for as much of the annoying crypto stuff as happens, uh, the good the good ones have stuck around to a large degree. And uh, I think along with that, uh, you know, you were talking about how like there's a certain nascent anti-wokeness in some mainstream entertainment which which is probably a good thing but there's also uh dan and i did an episode uh, a handful of episodes back now about uh what we you know some of the best tv of 2021 uh basically the white lotus and the season of succession with dasha in it uh and i i'm you know i'm sort of asking a question that i i feel like i know how you'll answer because i think i've heard you talk about both of these episodes both of these seasons of tv but I, I mean, there's I also seen Succession. Oh, yet. really? Uh, okay. I, I obviously, you know, love it for uh, yeah, <laughs> elevating Dasha to uh, mainstream celebrity actor prominence. But no, I haven't seen Succession yet. Uh, yeah. Oh, I don't. I think you'll like it when you see it because I don't. I, not just for Dasha, but also I think in a similar vein as White Lotus, I think it deals with issues in a i don't know i mean they, they're 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 definitely liberals behind making it but um but the, but there's you know it deals with themes that i wouldn't have expected to see in like 2016 2017 and, yeah. and obviously I, I really enjoyed um the the podcast you did on on mike white's enlightened with anna uh you know i guess it was like last month uh and you talk about mm-hmm. white lotus a bit in that as well anyway uh, I say all this to say I've been pretty heartened uh, by the degree to which some more genuinely based stuff is starting to find an audience. Truly, I mean, yeah. yeah. It's it's really surprising. And what's weird about it is that uh, the critical establishment largely does not even seem to notice the anti-woke themes. Like, Absolutely. Uh, well, the, the latest yeah. Netflix uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre sequel is another example. You know, it's not great, uh, but um, I quite enjoyed it. But the it's blatantly uh, in making fun of millennial liberals. Yeah, like the entire that's the entire theme of it. Like, there's a scene of Leatherface, uh, you know, holding the chainsaw up in front of this guy who has his phone out, and he sa- he like has Instagram live on. It. He's like, "You pull anything, then you're getting canceled." And like Le- Leatherface <laughs> like chops him in half, and the whole thing is like this, and it's totally blatant. But like the the crit- it's like the critics are blind to it because of how blatant this is. Yeah, it's I like think... the way that like um sometimes when movies are so overt with their uh, subversive themes, like people don't even notice it like Lars von Trier's Antichrist uh yeah. is like the most misogynist movie ever made like you know mythologically misogynist and you know totally b- like biblically blatant in every way <laughs> like calling women yeah. the Antichrist in the title and like you know it, it was 2009 but nobody really like noticed or cared uh, yeah <laughs> what but- it was really saying <laughs> With Von Trier, I feel like it's like everyone, and obviously he has gotten to some trouble for for certain comments. But people with him, it's like everyone's like, "Oh, he's so transgressive that obviously this is transgressive, and we'll just watch it because it's transgressive." And they don't actually think about the content, but there is you know real stuff there being explored. And then uh, definitely, I uh, with um with, with the White Lotus, uh, you know. I think, and I think you might think this as well, and, and, and as well as enlightened. So, so Mike White's work in general, I think there is an element of, of hiding in plain sight some of these ideas, and it, these things kind of. Uh, the White Lotus is, is maybe one of the best examples of this. It functions as like a, a raw shock test. Like you can watch that and take certain things at face value, or it's like, well, was that satirical, or was it not, or like who are the good guys here? Like you, you can, I don't mean this as a, as like a hands up 
cop out because I think no, I do think there is like a based message there, but there's a lot of de- plausible deniability where it's like absolutely like y- y- you know, and not to get too theoretical about it, but you you can you can make art and you can write in such a way that you know that the audience who would be bothered by it would be triggered by it to use a, a dated term um, is just not going to notice. It's going to fly over their head. It's like oh oh yeah, of course these. Well, a big part of this is that people don't know how to read media anymore. People straight up don't know how to actually critically evaluate cinema anymore because of the last 10 years, 10 plus years of uh, total idiocy. So, like, you know, young people, they don't know how to simply watch a moving image and, like, piece together a narrative in their mind and formulate coherent thoughts on what it meant anymore. All they know how to do and all they're trained to do in college media classes is to notice certain things that are supposed to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Like if you show a woman getting raped, that's wrong. Uh, If you say the N word in any context, that's wrong. Um, if you, uh, depict a stereotype as true, that's wrong. So they kind of like get, get this, or if you show, um, a naked woman, uh, supposed to be sexy, that's also wrong. Um, <laughs> so like they have this bare frame of like, they can tell when something is sort of subversive and immoral. Um, but they can't actually just look at something and, read the text divorced from whatever outside embroidery there's a critical embroidery they're supposed to be getting um so something as uh subtle and plausibly deniable and sophisticated as white lotus just registers as different and kind of vivid and has some kind of liveliness to it that other media of late does not have and that's because um a talented uh, white man was allowed to uh put his entire vision uncensored on the screen without a focus group of women diluting it yeah no i actually Absolutely. it's funny you should say that <laughs> that's, heard, that's um, the quality that you notice there <laughs> well another place and this is something else that you and others just everyone i guess is talking about now uh is euphoria which i i i don't do Fend. I, I do think there's a lot of crappy stuff in that show. I think it is pretty liberal. Blah blah blah. But the to the but also like it's it's obviously kind of like cinematic in a way that we're not used to seeing from TV. Uh, and it's it's impress. I, I know you you watch Euphoria, right, Jack? I haven't watched the latest season. Me neither. I actually, the first yeah. one. I don't think it's good. I think it's it's okay. Uh, what I like about it is that. Uh, it gets people heated and talking about a weekly TV show, uh, yeah. which hasn't happened in a long time with the advent of the streaming dump of Netflix, where stuff just gets dumped, you know, <laughs> a year apart. Um, so it's nice to sort of have this kind of online water cooler conversation. And you see, and Euphoria is what it does well is it's designed to be memed well. So all of the the shinwazery of the visuals in that they look kind of corny when you're actually watching it, but they look good in the form of memes being circulated and they do make you curious about what happened, you know, yeah, like for you see sure. The picture of, uh, what's her face, the chick from white Lotus, like all like fucked up with her mascara running down her face and everyone's sharing that. It, it does make me want to know what happened to her. Um, it is, of course, extremely libtarded. I mean, the, Zen, Zendaya is one of the biggest libtard psyops because she's just so boring, but is pushed out of every media outlet. My entire timeline is just targeted ads featuring her. She's in Dune. You know, she's not like bad, whatever. She's just nothing, you know, and yeah. uh, not particularly attractive. Not just, she's this kind of composite person that they can project anything onto um what's good also good about euphoria is that uh it features uh, a lot of titillating sexual content Mm -hmm. which i'm really happy makes all the like right-wing trad people mad so all the ones that get mad about (laughs) like 
uh, drag queen story hour and all that. I'm I'm glad when they're freaking out about Euphoria. Yeah, no, I'm. You you listen to the Brett Easton Ellis podcast. You're a listener to that, right, Jack? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I read, I was just yeah. on my drive home in prep. You know, what <laughs> driving to this podcast, I was listening to that podcast, and they were. I don't want to just like totally hijack this conversation to be talking about Euphoria, but they were saying some interesting stuff uh basically that made me i i'd kind of been burnt out on it uh like i you know more or less agree with what you said that it, it has it's 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 mostly not good but with some redeeming qualities apparently season two is a lot better um and, and but they but uh brett ellis and his guest were talking about how like it's the first show in ages that like teenagers could plausibly like hide the fact they were watching from their parents and like yeah there is a certain nostalgia for that kind of transgressive stuff but i brought euphoria up uh mostly because i and i was not aware of this but it makes sense that it happened uh that show gets a lot of love but some pushback from the woke crowd because uh sam levinson the guy who wrote wrote it and directed most of it um is just like a cis hetero straight you know white guy and it is pretty much an otorist project. So I, I mostly brought it up to say, uh, as libtard as that show is, um, the, the to the degree that it, it really cuts through and is something that people are excited about watching. I mean, I think oh, you they, have to. Yeah, yeah it's over it, the it same pisses, thing. It's it's not made by a committee. Of it that yeah, piss off like you know the right people. Um, the, the like underage sex stuff as i said you know they're all like 29 or whatever but still libtards and right wingers will be like is this okay to show like 25 year olds like being sexualized if they're playing high school <laughs> like just total like <laughs> retard ninny just mealy mouth puritan ninny stuff com- from both sides about that so that's good and also the libtards get mad that they allow sydney sweeney the like one conventionally hot like big breasted blonde girl currently allowed in all of media you know the fact that she's on the show and that she like shows her tits like yeah. uh, triggers them to no end because they only like the all the tranny stuff is for them like the most libtarded thing about euphoria i think is um how the tranny is depicted as the most imminently desirable and angelic and perfect person on earth and everyone especially you know the hot closeted straight guy and like the dad and all of these hot guys they're obsessed with the perfect angelic yeah. tranny yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Th- those trappings of well, it definitely annoying. i, I didn't yeah. even realize that that's that's not realistic yeah, no, it's right. it's not. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're not all obsessed with, the, with Sydney Sweeney. The Sydney, all yeah, I mean, like, no, she's really hot. I, yeah. <laughs> I've considered yeah. watching Euphoria just for her, but I, I can't bring myself to do it. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it definitely has those trappings, and like that's why I wasn't gonna watch season two. But the more I hear about it, and the more I hear, I would season two again is supposed to be better. The more I think that it's not like White Lotus, where I think there's something. Um, based going on beneath the surface. I just think there's something very genuinely artistic going on with Euphoria. Yeah, it's um, it's too much. It's um it's pretentious. A word that was overused a few years ago to the point where it had no meaning. Mm-hmm. But Euphoria is actually pretentious. Like that title is pretentious. I hate the title. Oh yeah. Uh, the the constant um refusal to allow anything to breathe with all this like uh greg a rocky like doom generation tumblr nostalgia kind of aesthetics is really corny and it would be a much better show if they just took themselves seriously and allowed a straightforward narrative to transpire instead of all this um flashy like the voiceover narration is also really awful right um like the whole structure of it is just a total disaster but if it were just like a racy cw or mtv show that were done straightforwardly without this incessant kind of like irony and self-awareness then it would be a lot better yeah but it it tries it tries to have its cake and eat it too you know like a kids for today that would be like a larry clark movie that actually accurately portrays today's youth culture that i think would be amazing yeah and this my friend barrett abner uh from the contained Mm -hmm. podcast he said it really well 
how Euphoria has this narrative artifice about it where it doesn't depict today's teens who are like more like asexual and atomized right. and isolated than ever before. Like it's this total fantasy of like this alternate reality where teens are like partying and doing drugs and having sex like people used to in like the 90s and 2000s and every time before that. Um but That's it's like really designed yeah. for the Zoomer like Instagram mind. Um, yeah, and the so, yeah, like the 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 poor Pornhub Instagram mind. You know, it's like both uh-huh. both of the I don't know, and which is actually you know you can kind of get behind that a little bit, like where it's like oh that it's encapsulating something about that about the state of I don't know image culture and 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 what kids are looking for in terms of that. But in terms of any kind of verisimilitude, yeah, I don't think there's much of that. But like found. all young people actually do now is they they look like Ella Imhoff and they like smoke those horrible like weed flash drives. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have sex, they don't do anything. They vaguely identify as non-binary whatever. Uh but they that they just smoke that horrible like medical weed juice and you know, they barely hang out and they just like post behind a screen of irony. <laughs> and Euphoria depicts them as like you know wild partying, like you know fucking all the time, and you know, it's just not. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think it is a total. <laughs> Doesn't reson- This is probably in- unintentional as well, but like Euphoria also feeds into one of the most um, annoying misconceptions that conservatives have that I'm constantly battling against that they think that Democrats are like the party of like wild sexual hedonism, which is not true whatsoever. This is the most de-sex, yeah. like anti-sex, sex phobic moment in history ever. And all of the kind of, um, uh, like the porn hub only fans, mm-hmm. sex education kind of stuff that liberals push. It's not actually literal sex. It's just this like bureaucratic appropriation of, the sex drive um and me too is another aspect where like you're only allowed to like have sex fantasies and like uh uh like be libidinous at all if you're describing yourself as you know in constant pursuit by a rapey man and all of this but like like the kind of like uh talking head uh he, suit and tie conservatives that are always going on about drag queen story hour and like masturbation education from libtards in schools and and all of this like they they live under this wild delusion that liberals are having like bacchanalian orgies all the time and the 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 fact of it is is that like porn even barely exists in the way that it once did on the internet like when they got rid of porn on tumblr uh, that did away with tons of it when they got rid of like most of the porn on Pornhub. Even the people constantly bring up Pornhub as like oh, Pornhub is the ultimate like globo homo. Yeah, it's bad or whatever, but there's like barely anything on it anymore, <laughs> largely because of liberals. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's uh, OnlyFans is more this like this just like kind of sad little like social media exhibitionism thing that girls do where they like LARP as prostitutes. Uh, Because that's, you know, something that's subsumed under the kind of online communism leftist uh, identity, this like uh, this pathetic, uh, like countercultural prostitute LARP. Um, Right. But they don't really do much of anything. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Like there's there's real issues uh, afflicting, you know, people, people today and young people today. But uh, it's not really so much this excess of a, any kind of Dionysian or Bacchanalian spirit. It's uh, it's it's like some some very just degraded version of that. And that's part and parcel of a broader issue of I guess atomization and you know web addiction or or, or however you want to put it. Web addiction is the real scourge right now, and you know I heard it said several years ago that like we're going to look back on the way that we use social media and the way that we were all addicted to our phones and the way that people look back on um you know pictures from the 50s where every single person is smoking cigarettes except that cigarettes are not nearly as harmful as social media we're just in this unfortunate moment where 
there hasn't it hasn't been dealt with honestly because it's simply too profitable for everyone to prolong it and it's so easy to prolong it but like now we're in this like sad kind of like wandering like alcoholic like addiction kind of phase of of uh, social media addiction where when you realize it's a problem it seems funny it just seems like log off bro but this it ruins everyone's life <laughs> Yeah. yeah. You know, it you really start does. it changes the way you think. Like you start thinking in tweets. You start like, you know, you can't read a book. It's, you don't uh, exist offline. It's no good. Yeah. Yeah. And well, all of the discourse yeah. kind of, like trickles down from Twitter. Like everything. You can say all that you want about like log off, don't do social media, whatever. Regardless, the media machine is still going to keep turning and it all comes straight from Twitter. Everything that you see on every uh, news channel is like Twitter's leftovers at the end of the day. So it's the center of all of this discourse. Yeah. It's like, you, I mean, obviously we all came into contact via social media. So it's like, it's, it's inescapable that within that, I do think, you know, you can find ways to, uh, to not let it consume you. And I think that's kind of the task facing all of us. I, I hope that we, that we live into a future where, where we can look back on some of the web addiction, the way that, you know, incessant cigarette smoking is now looked. I mean, I'm also not always, I'm not always that optimistic because I kind of feel like it's here to stay, but I guess we'll, I guess we'll I mean, see. I mean, alcohol, like any drug is easier to quit than social media, than web addiction, because these are all established things. You have like a support network. It has a name. There are people who will take it seriously. But now there's no point that it ever gets taken seriously by anyone. So you're left to discover the way to deal with it yourself, like all yeah. on your own. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, um, I mean another another topic to change change uh switch gears a little bit here. Um definitely wanted to get get kind of meta about podcasting uh you know we're talking about we were talking about negative social media addiction and such well i guess podcasting might be a uh <laughs> a, mo a slightly more positive thing to come out of the internet mm -hmm. in my opinion um but anyway it Jack, exists I, separately you know it you're, does it's it, uh, if you're doing it right it stands on its own i think so um, and it can be appreciated in a much more not analog but you know you can download a podcast and you can listen to it when you're offline there's something about the podcast that you know has has kind of one foot off the internet shall we say mm -hmm. um which is something i really appreciate about it. i remember there was a time to to get a little bit premature not nostalgic whatever the opposite of nostalgic is to, to, to get a little bit like modern history about some of this stuff i remember in like 2018 20 mostly 2018 uh youtube live streaming was huge and that's how a lot of people wanted to do their you know basically their podcast was all about you know the, the live the three hour live extravaganza with super chats and whatnot and i never liked that because it always I hate felt that too ghetto. transient youtube is ghetto uh, for podcasts i have always refused yeah a, to a total ghetto in terms of ideology and just a total like attention suck where it's like this deeply negative experience of getting sucked into someone's stream where there's some drama going on uh, as opposed to podcasting which always felt uh, intellectual would be a pretentious word, but like just a much more comfortable medium where you can kind of unplug and, and specifically choose to listen to a podcast. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, just that that podcasting. Yeah, it has kind of one one foot o away from from that really negative online stuff. I don't um, know how anyone could see that super chat stream stuff and not run for the hills. Like <laughs> it, you know, it's just. Well, in Twitter uh, space, I should say Twitter. It's I don't even know about. I've live... never clicked on a Twitter space because it looks me, like that to me. Me neither. But basically, <laughs> I don't get that's, a fuck about that. Yeah. That's that's what's in now. That's what the whole like Richard Spencer crowd on Twitter is all about. Is the the spaces and it's Gross. basically it's basically YouTube live streaming on a new platform. Um, and Ooh. it's yeah, I'll what never. What was that thing that was very popular like almost a year ago now that became popular as like. Twitter spaces, like a, a progenitor of that fleets that, uh, Telegram? where it was like, 
what treehouse, whatever, all those things. Uh, there were so yeah. many oh, moments clubhouse. where all the conservatives clubhouse, were clubhouse, like, yeah. Yes, yes, where all the conservatives in their suits and ties were like, We're being deplatformed imminently and you have to <laughs> move over to this new shitty <laughs> thing. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was one of them. And I was like, I where do I where do people have the time and space to like talk into their phone like this like yeah you know? no, no, exactly <laughs> like i had a friend who's like yeah you should go on clubhouse they're having all the conversations and like uh, okay and it's, it's like massive. well uh you okay you got to be on at like 4 15 but uh maybe it'll be like eight o'clock i i have a real schedule uh, you, you know what it is partially and this will lead on to what else i want to say about podcasting and what else i want to highlight that you said jack about podcasting a podcast People laugh at this, but it is a work of art. It is something that you plan, that that you give a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily edit it extensively, but there's some kind of editing process. Like it is a it is a specifically curated thing that is you know bookended. And there's intentionality to every step of it. Uh, even if it, even if it's just three guys chatting and you pretty much put it up, it's still there's it's like intentionality to the way that it's framed. And that's mm-hmm. what's totally lacking in those spaces and, and whatnot. Absolutely. I'm sure there's right. been some, just some, total some good chaos. ones. Yeah. Like if you like a podcast feed provides enough organization that you can go down the line and listen to all, all the episodes. And regardless of the quality or whatever it is, you will piece together a narrative and you will find something to hook on to uh, something that interests to, and you will see characters fade in and out. And this is, Something that's always really interested me about this genre, which um, is a revival of radio. Like, the word Mm -hmm. podcast is really unfortunate, and it's always wielded by people who have uh, tried and failed at making podcasts, and so they're bitter bitter little haters. Um, But the way that people say podcast is basically the way that people say the (laughs) N-word. So so it's always like, podcasters, podcast, you know, and podcasters, uh, podcasts are experiencing... Uh, like unprecedented cultural influence and popularity right now, observably. So that's why you always have this um, this haters table of poor unfortunate souls uh, claiming that they're over uh, because they couldn't do it themselves. Right. Um, but you know, as I talk about all the time, I've always been interested in long form maximalist, huge narratives, soap operas. My prime right. inspiration which, you know, are continuous five-day-a-week narratives uh, that have, uh, in the the case of many of these soaps, gone on for, like, almost a century. And some of them started out as radio shows. Um, Yeah. But, like, podcasts do the same thing in this kind of, like, improvisational manner. Like, you can... You can make an outline and obviously plan what topics and what people you're going to have on, but there's an exciting element of improvisation if you allow it to breathe um, and just allow the conversation to exist in a somewhat naturalistic manner. Uh, But, you know, if you listen from the start to the finish, you're getting the whole picture. And that's why I've always encouraged people to do that with TPN, because there's this uh mm-hmm. there's this terrible kind of short attention span mindset of the present day where that comes from streaming media where people think they can like pick and choose everything and just dip in and w- watch a couple of minutes and then they act like they're a critical authority on it or they they have anything uh of value to say about it whatsoever and you know Obviously, people will have a first episode of what they're listening to the first time they finally listen to TPN or whatever, um, but they don't get the whole thing. They don't get the whole experience unless they know everything that came before that. So a yeah, lot of it, will, you know, it's just like t- it's just like um, someone picking a random page out of a book and saying like, "Well, those are words, word salad," mm-hmm. you know. Unless you see the complete work, you don't get it. Yeah, no, I think you you you're probably the only person I've I've ever heard really say that that one should actually listen to, you know, every episode of a podcast. Yeah, I but started I, that. Now I feel I, like I've, I've almost gone too far. Like the art podcast that yeah, nobody was put, calling them art before that. I also feel like I might have 
it, it may have like uh, spun out of control at this point. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, literally nobody said that before. No, I don't <laughs> think so. I, I, but, from start to finish. But I think you're right, uh, and I think that I, it really is. Uh, I, I don't know if I would have had this notion without hearing you say it or, or what, but I, I mean, it is what I try to do. I haven't done it with TPN yet, but I intend to, and I've heard much, I've heard, you know, I've heard a lot of the beginning episodes, and I've heard recent episodes, I've heard some stuff in the middle. It's less than ideal. Uh, one day, I really hope I can say that I've heard the entire thing, but I... I always I, be waiting. <laughs> yeah, all, all projected 14 years of it. Yeah, and it's, it's all right there. I mean, that's one thing... Uh, to to kind of give another shout out to my friend, like when I first I, I got into all this because of Robert Stark's podcast, and I, one thing I always really loved about his podcast, and, and fewer people are even familiar with it, but he basically has about a ten year archive of interviews, and just oh, the yeah. fact that it's Sick. all there, and you can see it, it's yeah, I don't I don't know, it's 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 the whatever the opposite of that live stream chaos thing where it's like some conversation <laughs> that that's just trash. thinks it's so important. I mean... it's, it's a it's a it's a solid archive. It's something that can breathe and develop over time, like a novel, like you know, a great movie. Uh, you know, some people will laugh at this, but I think that uh, no, you you Jack have articulated it really well, and it it is probably the best way. Um, well, thank you. I, yeah, yeah I, I appreciate it. They laugh now, but once their little like uh, New Yorker article saying <laughs> saying this in a more boring fashion comes out, they'll all be. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be saying it too. Um, yeah, but, I mean, you you've said, uh, did you say this that people talk about podcasts now the way people used to talk about movies before that was like a respected medium? Oh yeah, it's a disreputable, I mean, low class medium, uh, and it's in exactly that kind of state. And like movies were like you know the, the for the century that movies were the dominant art form, the gesamt Kunstwerk. Uh, you know, the way that auteurs uh, drew on every single art form and combined them into one, you know, ultimate masterpiece, you know, music, visuals, um, theater, all of it. Uh, that is unlikely to happen again, simply because of the the scattering of culture and media right. in this way. And like podcasts have found popularity because they're something that operates uh, independent of the dying dinosaur mainstream media institutions, which have become so corrupt and gray and horrible that they're just frantically trying to like maintain their grasp over culture. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just independent radio and it's became popular because regular people can do it and uh, provide different viewpoints that are uh you know saying what everyone thinks outside mm -hmm. of the obvious lies of mainstream media like which even like most libs came to realize how they were being manipulated after yeah. covid was brought back you know for the third time <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> and oh. often it's it's funnier and better. Like I, I remember your episode with Howling Mutant, who uh, or, or Mutant, who uh, who's actually going to be on New Right in the near future. <laughs> oh, nice! Uh, yeah, he's the best. And yeah, no, he's. Yeah, I, I told him he's one of the funniest guys on Twitter, and uh, I appreciated the comedy conversation on that episode. And yeah, like Come Town is mm -hmm. you know one of the funniest you know. Uh, items of media out there right now absolutely and and but the, but the reason is because it's a podcast like as you said on that episode like if you know like nick mullen's stand-up is good but it's not anywhere near as good as you know come town because, because you rely on a crowd if you're rely, le, relying on a crowd in that stand-up way like you can't actually be Funny. honest yeah <laughs> real you're, it's like you're setting up a joke is you know set up whereas like the podcast is like this great medium that you know we're i think still just like finding out what we can do with it yeah yeah no jack and you, i mean you have in terms of finding out what we can do with it i i think that in addition to having said all these great things about podcasting episodes like the mall and uh maybe even more so this eight hour and 45 
minute uh, debut of season four of the Perfume Nationalist, Dallas. Uh, I mean, these are absolutely. I don't mean this facetiously. They're absolutely groundbreaking in terms of kind of like push, pushing. Uh-huh. Yeah, pushing. Thank you. I don't know if pushing the envelope is. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. like find, finding new 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 ways. Uh, you know, for this medium to be. I think. You know, it's 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 just it's great to see. Yeah, well, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that you get it, because uh, kind of blurring those lines between reality and podcast is and uh, the the media that I'm talking about, which was what I was mm-hmm. specifically trying to do with with Dallas, uh, was to kind of like work this kind of uh, <laughs> magic where we're on the location of Dallas South Fork Ranch. Um, and you know entering between dimensions like in twin peaks the return right style like where it all happened um so yeah, I'm continually yeah. trying to like uh work that kind of magic and it, it was like the perfect time for that too because i sensed the owner of south fork died last year and oh, i had yeah. this like stirring like it probably won't exist forever and apparently uh there's like a bidding war going on and there somebody some property developer is probably going to buy it and turn it into condos or something um mm-hmm. but that's why oh, no. i immortalized it on there um so all of this stuff you know now if you're like a podcast listener in this kind of scene you're probably more accustomed to uh the field recording stuff like red scares the zoo was the first one um <laughs> and, oh, i'm not familiar that's not yeah we, that red scares the zoo was was the <laughs> inspiration for the mall gotcha okay I didn't realize. um yeah yeah there's an episode where they, they went to the zoo <laughs> and, oh god um, wow uh and uh it, but then, you know, like a, a person on the outside or like an older person, especially if you have like chronic Gen X brain, they're just like, that's boring. Who would listen to that? Because <laughs> they, <laughs> they don't get it. They they think they think the podcasts are supposed to be 45 minute fast edited NPR interviews and that everything else is like a mistake. And like, it sounds corny to say like avant-garde experimental, whatever, but like, that's what it is. And guess what? People like it. People like boredom. And you can see that because the most famous and successful podcast ever is Joe Rogan, which is all those episodes are four hours long. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Yeah. There's something meditative you know about some of these podcasts which is something that we're sorely missing in like so many other realms of life i mean i listen to podcasts the way that i read novels you know it's it's that that same yeah that same my stories it's the way i watch so right listen to my friends like i feel like such a loser for listening to all my friends podcasts but really it's like better it's just they're good it just happens they're all good (laughs) and i like hearing what they're doing and i like hearing their conversations with everyone so it's like keeping up with my stories like your granny for sure watching guiding light i was gonna ask you what are and you know you may have a long answer to this which is fine uh but what are the podcasts that you keep up most regularly with um i'm so popular uh Mm -hmm. red scare um brendan's tales from the mall right of course uh whatever brendan does he always has a lot of things going um my friend filthy armenians filthy armenian adventures um (laughs) what else there's oh thought topics thought topics is the most underrated podcast in existence they're they're amazing yeah and they just they are stars just waiting to be discovered um, but yeah, it's it's basically those. You know, I, I dip into other things, but it's so time consuming uh, to oh, like, yeah. l- listen to the whole thing. That um, sure, I feel like I know everyone really. Well. It's funny you like listen to oh, and car crash, car crash um, is another one. Car crash is wonderful, uh, but yeah, it's it's kind of unnerving how uh, if people listen to your podcast and they know every thought you've ever had in your head. Um, uh, cause they've been brainwashed by like, you know, hundreds of hours of you speaking uh, but, yeah, <laughs> anyway, but yeah, like back when I first started saying all that, like, uh, you know, way back in like season two, when I was like, you have to listen to TPN from the start, uh, in its entirety, uh, they, the people, the haters would all get so mad. Like it is impossible. It is just unbelievable that you are suggesting that everyone who criticizes you is expected to 
listen to hundreds of hours of your like why why is that so unthinkable like if i wrote a book and expected you to read the whole thing before talking about it authoritatively uh that's not ridiculous yeah um yeah yeah true. it's just funny and yeah and then you know a couple of years after i say something they all imitate it after it's yeah. you know, dead and <laughs> safe for them so. well, well maybe you've already answered this but i definitely did i guess i've always wanted to ask you uh, what, what what would your message be to, to people? And you hear this line all the time. People are like, I don't listen to podcasts. Even from like other people I otherwise like. You know, they, they say, I don't listen to podcasts. I mean, um, what's what's the best? I mean, it's kind of a stupid question, like, but yeah. I mean, it still seems like such, a, such an interior protected little world. Because I've never even met anyone in real life who knows what like chapo is like right. barely anyone like Rhett normies like you know they really do have like the gray face and the dead yeah, eyes like yeah, they don't yeah, know yeah, what yeah. any of this shit is so they listen that's to podcast what... they listen to true crime podcast yeah, and maybe they, like one or two from NPR. and you try to yeah. explain like when i quit my job it got around that i was a podcaster and they kept like asking me questions about it <laughs> and i tried to like explain like oh i talk about like movies and perfume and it just doesn't register they just give you a look which is kind of good because it acts kind as, of like, good. a protective yeah. shell whatever uh but every time the the libtard blue check twitter journos gin up these little hit pieces on like podcasters it never works because normal people don't know what the fuck they're talking about. yeah oh yeah, yeah that doesn't true. make sense to anyone who's outside of uh, like twitter that's <laughs> you know that's why um, i never really worry about getting doxxed is because like i just don't think what i do online would even make sense <laughs> to anyone <laughs> and they know people don't want to think about this either it's like oh like the worst case scenario is someone's like oh like someone gets told like oh matt has like a vaguely problematic podcast and then like the question would be like well well what but is a podcast like oh like, he's talking about you, movies what's or, yeah yeah people can't dox you if you dox yourself like you know yeah. it's just if you make it a big thing uh, this little narrative for people to like uncover you and ruin you then you're allowing it to happen like uh, obviously, I understand there are extenuating circumstances, and I understand what's happening in the world. But really, if you give off a certain vibe of like, uh, I can be doxxed, then they really do it. But if you're yeah. just upfront about who you are, and you you know in your heart that nothing you do is wrong, then it's just like you have a different experience than acting like you know, like self ghettoing and acting like a pariah and like everything that you do is so forbidden and wrong and it's really it's really depressing and you mm -hmm. know it's uh but the, the uh yeah those those hit pieces never work because none of it makes sense to anyone but also you know one of the fortunate things about tpn is that there are a lot of listeners who message me who are people who are not in any way involved with twitter and i love that you know, yeah. th those are like my favorite listeners because that's proof that it uh, resonates and has meaning outside of this Twitter garbage. If you're doing a Twitter podcast, you're setting yourself up for failure. You know, you can ha obviously have elements of this, but if you're just recapping the day's Twitter shit, this is not going to leave any kind of lasting impact. So I don't care what happens to me on Twitter. All I care about is that, you know, the archive of TPN exists. Um mm -hmm. And I like having it um, fairly simple and streamlined. Like, uh, I, I, there's a lot of kind of like diffuse. Like, people will like uh, diffuse themselves into too many like places and spaces and make their sort of like online narrative hard to follow if they're constantly on those like cursed streams as you said like leftists mm -hmm. do a lot of this kind of like aesthetically revolting kind of like <laughs> stuff where they're spread out everywhere but i like people being able to simply look at the tpn feed and you know going from one to 144 whatever it is now and that's it <laughs> yeah no for sure um Kind of a random question that I, you know, if it, if it's, if it's not productive to anything interesting, uh, I won't necessarily put in the podcast, but do you, and I'm, I'm just interested in this and again, not to rehash the whole, the, the, the frog Twitter versus like, you know, more, more open sphere, uh, discussion from earlier, but do you, do you keep up with, uh, BAPS podcast at all? No, uh, it was God awful, uh, like unlistable, you know, um, 
I listened to the first several when he started it, which was probably five months after I started TPN Mm -hmm. and several months after Campbot started Tech Wars. Um, And I found it so, like, stilted and, uh, like, cloistered and unnatural and kind of like defensive and i'm sure there's the the sort of person that all of this appeals to but i i found it totally unlistenable i i guess he's been doing it for like several years now so it may yeah. be something totally different now but i mean it's similar I, i'm something of a fan uh, but it's obviously not for for everyone but it's it is kind of a, it's like an at an opposite end of of the spectrum i guess aesthetically in the way i mean just in terms of the way he presents himself i guess is the opposite Oof. I can't of see it. I just again. Uh, <laughs> I like I, the book. Obviously, the second right. episode of TBM well, was about the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was kind of the first. I, I can't stand yeah. him. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I did. Yeah. I. I don't, I don't want to get into like some kind of uh, back and forth. Yeah, with, he'll uh, send his guys after you. Right. 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 <laughs> um, no, I was just curious because I did. I did. My understanding was that at least his book and, and to some degree his Twitter presence was kind of an early. Not inspiration, but like an early, you know, thing oh, that you were a fellow travel of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It was yeah, an yeah. early inspiration, and yeah. he was the first like big account who retweeted me a lot. Yeah, it, it was a, yeah. uh, you know, back in the the Middle Ages of Twitter. Yeah, he was this his combination of the like homoerotic imagery, and he would like push things like polya that like no one would dare push then because like degenerate lesbian feminist whatever like he was an early um shining light at that time Mm -hmm. and you know the the book was good um and i kind of like yeah as you said saw like a fellow traveler there um but it's his dogged insistence on anonymity for everyone forever well that's my really like a defensive thing that he does because uh, he, he there's really no reason for him to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. But that is counterproductive. Um, Yeah. Yeah. No, that was kind of my, my understanding of what had sort of happened between you and him. I just, and again, I'm I'm not trying to, I do, I don't want to turn the conversation to some like um, tabloid thing where it's like, what really happened between. Well, I mean, the simple explanation of what happened is that he like, whatever, there was the big fight between him and can And I was, I was better friends with Campot, and I'm loyal, so <laughs> I took yeah. Campot's side. Like, that's what, you know, and then Campot yeah. became, like, uh, unhinged and libtarded, of course, as everyone right. knows. Um, but at the time, sorry, I, I've, I've never been a person who has a problem choosing sides. And the way that he just, you know, g- ghosts around in character or kind of manipulating people, I, I found very unsavory. Um, and I like I liked Campot's um, more honest nerd persona <laughs> a lot more and i liked him more as yeah, a person yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes sense yeah no i just was kind of curious that, yeah um to, just to, it's always interesting to me when when like someone is inspired by something but then comes to reject it yeah, yeah. that's i guess what the the, the interesting the interestingness of, of that whole a whole narrative to me but anyway I mean, he's yeah. like uh whatever happened to baby jane like fading fading queen these days so mm-hmm well, uh, it is getting later, and it's later for you guys than it is for me, so we can wrap up pretty soon. But um, before we do that, I just wanted to, and I, obviously, Jack, you have so you, you have so much, so many hours of podcasting. I'm sure you've kind of talked about this before, but since we are a literary podcast, um, just wanted to get you, like get you to comment. I mean, I know I know you're a big Ayn Rand fan, and I, you did and another early TPN episode was women in love uh dh lawrence but so feel free to feel free to just say those as answers uh you don't need to like control what you're saying here but um i guess i'm just curious like what what some of the the big the big books the big novels for you growing up as well as now like what are what are the major touchstones uh well above all i think that everyone should put down the nonfiction and read any fiction written before Mm -hmm. 2000 and you will find that more intellectually enriching and artistic. Uh, even if it was something that was considered quote unquote trash at the time, it is guaranteed uh, intellectually miles above anything that anyone 
online or off is producing today in terms of sophistication uh in terms of complexity in terms of writing quality because of the simple fact that people don't actually read anymore and Mm -hmm. what you you know i don't i don't like whatever exists as literary fiction right now it just seems to be this kind of circle jerk of uh giving like affirmative action awards to a very small oh, yeah, group of sure. people for, sure. <laughs> for mediocre kind of magical realism stuff that's easy for anyone to do where they it's it can be kind of shitty but uh come off as like okay uh but if there's like a black woman behind it or you know uh, then the shower it in awards oh. But some Judith Krantz scruples is like my Bronze Age mindset. Okay, this is uh, the first um, one of the first big epic uh, shopping and fucking novels, uh, the genre that would become huge in the eighties, like Jackie Collins stuff, where it was these huge like eight hundred page books about like uh, women uh, rising to the top of like the fashion or publishing industry or whatever in a Trumpian manner. Um, all with lavish American psycho descriptions of uh, of clothes and food and everything else. Um, Scruples is the greatest of all of these. Judith Gould's Sins, uh, Shirley Conran's Lace. Uh, anyone should pick up any of these. I've just been reading a lot of random stuff. Like I read um, Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood a couple of weeks ago oh, yeah, and yeah. thought it was uh, phenomenal. Um, yeah, any fiction before 2000. There's this saying that you hate fiction is a libtard, uh, neolib, uh, NPC red flag at this point. That became just one of those kind of like recited trends uh, of received opinions that people learned how to parrot uh, because it signified they thought that they were some sort of intellectually superior person. Person, but no, you need to be reading uh, fiction. Absolutely. No, I, I couldn't agree more. It kind of goes along with what you were saying about podcasts earlier, but maybe it's even more extreme than that. Like podcasts, I think, kind of break you out a little bit of the general flow of onlineness, and it gives you something a little more meditative to focus on. Reading fiction. And I, I mean, I, I enjoy nonfiction as well, but I agree that there's even more of a need, I think, for people to pick up fiction. Um, does that in an even more profound way? Uh, we're we're so. I, I think one thing that being online all the time really makes us unattuned to is being able to effectively, uh, you know, tap into fictional worlds. And I think that it's really, uh, it's you know, really beneficial you know, for your mind, but also just deeply enjoyable, uh, to, to cultivate, you know, being able to do that. And I think a lot of people have lost the ability. And you like all of this knowledge is just hidden. All of this stuff, like any given, uh, piece of popular fiction from before 20 years ago is guaranteed to be more transgressive and shocking than anything you can find in cinema, you know, anywhere. Like, like this because part of the appeal of reading this stuff was that it was tawdry so all of this stuff there was you know just moms were reading left and right it's just filled with the most shocking kind of sensational trash uh sensational content imaginable and it's amazing to like discover this as you're reading it when it's just like nobody knows about this nobody cares and we're currently in this moment where like books are just being given away like if you're looking for a specific book that's out of print and hard to find online then it's going to be expensive but you go to any half price you go to any library whatever it's just nobody wants the space taken up in their life but you have to have a a physical library you really do oh yeah Um, i I, you i don't remember where you said it but you uh you're not so much of a fan of uh well not kindles but especially not reading random pdfs on your computer right oh You're... pdf is the sign <laughs> of an idiot like you, and you can tell all those big account anonymous guys they're always you know the four screenshots of the pdfs like there is no <laughs> way it lends itself to like almost guarantees this kind of like shrill annoying fake intellectual pretension that does not come from anyone who is reading an actual book from start to finish and i remember one of the uh, one of the funniest uh, kind of like freakouts uh, that people had over one of my tweets was when I like pointed out that um, 
you shouldn't consider that you've read something unless you've read every word start to finish. And mm-hmm. like all the suits online, uh, you know, came at me and were like, actually, I went to college and learned how to skim the art of skimming. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, OK, no, that's that's not reading it. It's just opening it. Anyone can do that. Um, it's actually difficult and time consuming to read. Um and it's exercise for the mind, but yeah, it, it just like exposed them all as just the biggest fakes when I said that. Yeah. <sighs> all yeah, right. No reading every Go on, word Dan. gets yeah. you into. <laughs> and and it's people, like a different. To... I'm sorry. You know, Go on. It's like a different mindset. It you know it reshapes your mind to actually read a book word by word. And then, you know, by the end of reading it, you're like out of that Twitter zone of thinking oh. in short sentences or not even sentences. And so it's, you know, not only does it give you knowledge, it's also like good exercise for your brain. Oh, mm-hmm. absolutely. It's it's totally necessary exercise for the brain. And you notice the positive effects instantly. Um, but like people have to learn how to read again just like pick a difficult book pick a long book whatever and just read 25 pages at it put your phone in the other room i have to put my phone in the other room to read and read 25 pages and then you can take a break walk around go pee whatever and that makes it easy (laughs) yeah it's like anything else you have to kind of start in uh smaller steps as it were Uh um but yeah so uh i mean you've talked about potentially publishing some kind of perfume nationalist book some kind of physical you know book that people can buy is that is there, are there are there plans for that in the work currently? yeah definitely i mean it's always there have been plans for so long um now i actually finally have the time to do it since i don't have to hold the day job um so it's just up to me but yeah i definitely want to um transpose uh the show into some literary object yeah no Um, i think it's a a great idea and not that this is the reason to do it but i i do think that if you self-published it which i imagine you would i i think you'd actually turn a a, a not insignificant profit i have to say because when you when you self-publish you get all the other royalties and i think a lot of people would be ready to buy Absolutely. I mean, is there even is there even perfume nationalist merch? Not really. Right? Uh, no, there isn't yeah. any right now. We, there was one like really cheap uh, run of t shirts like way back in season two. Um, yeah. So I would like to figure out, uh, you know, getting together some merch. I've just been enjoying myself lately, right. like having having uh, all of this time to uh, really like study the materials of what I'm talking about mm-hmm. at length in a way that I never could before it was always like rushed and um you know which is part of it like if, you, if you're starting a podcast what you must do is do it every week as work yeah <laughs> like regardless of how yeah. you feel oh, yeah. and, you know regardless of how good you think it is uh if you do it every week as work and make it a habit regardless of your mental state whether you're hungover whatever um then that's the key um yep it's I think uh, Dan and I pretty much been following <laughs> that yeah it's, yeah. uh, and it is work, mm-hmm. but it's good it's work. Total, it, people think, people, they don't get it. They don't get, they think these conversations just occur organically <laughs> when there's so many elements that have to come together. You have to oh, yeah. get Absolutely. people together to talk. It's just, you know, it's annoying to talk about, but like the, the haters who have never done it themselves really don't get all the things that go together, especially for like a show like mine where I'm like getting people usually to talk about like pretty like obscure and like difficult uh media and stuff like getting people to watch that stuff or read anything there's just so much that goes into it but i i love doing it i'll do it forever yeah no it's fantastic <laughs> well we will certainly uh keep listening um Absolutely. You know, excited to see where season four of the perfume nationalist goes <laughs> the and maybe continuing narrative the continue the continuing saga of course yeah. or the ongoing saga how whatever you say yeah the continuing um, story yeah that's from peyton place uh, oh peyton, it's peyton place starts out with the the announcer's voice going you know no and the continuing story of peyton place yeah <laughs> at some point you replaced 
you basically sub that in for the old line, which was the official podcast of the Live, Laugh, Love lifestyle. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I liked live, that, laugh, too. Love, you know, that was that was a particular... Season two was Live, Laugh, Love. Yeah. Season two, the darkest season. <laughs> darkest and most <laughs> miserable season was Live, Laugh, Love. And then, yeah, I just... Uh, just got sick of live life love after a while well yeah i guess you have to switch it up at some point but that that always was uh pretty funny to me um yeah i don't know if it's worth doing this like on the recording here but i i will i think uh I, we were you know sad to see uh orton step away mm-hmm. but um i guess it's worth shouting out he uh not that this was like some kind of extensive relationship we had but he and the, when dan and i were starting new right he gave us some good advice on the kind of uh, audio, so just some of the odd, like basically what you guys do to record. So I'll always appreciate. Oh yeah, that. I mean, he he figured yeah. out all of that for TPN, and it was his idea to record it. So yeah, uh, yeah. it wouldn't have happened without him. Yeah. Well, thankfully to, Matt yeah. has absorbed <laughs> all of that. So not yeah. not quite not quite all of it. <laughs> I still don't exactly. I should figure it out he, he did some kind of frequency pass on one on like an early episode of ours that was helpful so i'm, I'm no i'm no expert but you know yeah trying to figure it out yeah yeah i don't i don't i basically watched like youtube tutorials and like pieced it together and i'm like it sounds okay uh, yeah but uh, yeah it's, i'm having fun experimenting with it these days so cool all right well um unless dan do you have anything else Dad. No, I, I just enjoyed the conversation, and uh, thank you for coming on, Jack. It's uh, you know, it's really an honor. Oh, thanks so much, guys. You've said so many nice things. It warms my heart. Uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, thank you so awesome. much for coming on, and have right. a, have a great rest of your night. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks, Jack. Bye. Mm-hmm.